Welcome back to Good Morning Tobago. I am Adana Kambi and we have interesting conversations this morning in studio. So we're so happy that you're here and that you've chosen us. We're speaking this morning with um, Assemblyman and Secretary with the responsibility for food security, natural resources, the environment and sustainable development, Assemblyman uh, Natisha Charles Pantin. And we're also speaking with Assemblyman Niall George. He's the Assistant Secretary in the Division of Settlements, Public Utilities and Rural Development and also the area representative for Plymouth Blackrock and we're having a very interesting and important conversation this morning. You might have seen a circulation of a video on social media platforms yesterday as it relates to um, the species of turtles. Uh, very, very disturbing indeed and so we're going to have that conversation this morning to get some more information, some insights, some updates and also to discuss the actions that are going to be taken if any um, and you know what sort of recommendations are being made in this instance. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, good morning, good morning, Tobago. Good morning, Scummy. Good morning, Tobago. Right, it's always a pleasure having you um, on our our show to discuss, you know, relevant and pertinent things that are happening. And right now we have something that is happening in real life, real time, and affecting not only the existence of these turtles, but I feel as if sometimes people don't realize that the actions also affect human life right and human sustainability and the way that we um, preserve what we have for generations to come so we've seen this video circulating on social media as recent as yesterday where a developer a landowner is has dug some trenches on a property close to his. I'm not even certain if where he dug is even his property. So we want to clarify that as well, right? And we want to, he's saying because of what has happened in the past with his property. But first and foremost, can we clarify where this development, and I'm putting in inverted commas here, this development is taking place. Is it on the property of the owner, the person who is doing this development? Where is this taking place? Well, Ms. Combe, it's the development is mostly taking part on their property. Mm -hmm. But um, the trenches that we dug, that's been far reaching because that spans onto the beach. Mm -hmm. And that is where the ambiguity is taking place. Now, we have this turtle nesting site, the main turtle nesting site on, on the island, beyond the environmental effects that it can have. It is also a crucial element of our tourism product. And this is something that we need to protect and we need to, to have intact. So that's why we are reaching out to the agencies, the relevant agencies to, to deal with the situation. The thing about it is that this is, I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking that some of these areas should be protected. I know you said that part of where he's digging is on his property, but it also extends beyond. Does a citizen, an average, a regular citizen, have permission or authority to do any type of development on any property that is not theirs, that was not issued to them by any agency, whether it be government, private, whatever? Do they have the permission to do something of that nature? So it's a very delicate situation because we don't want to infringe on anyone's right to their property. But in developing your property, there could be repercussions for others neighboring. And, and that's where the issue is with this property as far as I am concerned as a representative, because recently there were some heavy rains and you could see the, the, devast the potential for, for devastation within the community because there's serious flooding, flooding in areas that never had that type of flooding before. And as I, I said before, I want to reiterate it. I, the landowner has all rights to enjoyment of his property, but he also does not have the right to destroy others. So where his property is concerned, we would like him to be able to develop his property. Yes, but it's the way it is being done. And we would like all stakeholders to be in, in a mutually beneficial relationship where everyone would enjoy the development. And you're saying, you know, uh, where all stakeholders will be able to ha will come to a mutually beneficial situation, um, especially for the people in Tobago, the tourism. There are so many things that are impacted by this action. And I know that there are some spaces that are protected 
right, because of the habitation there and because of, you know, certain things that take place in those areas. Is this one of those areas? And if it is not, are there any discussions on the table now to ensure that areas like this are protected from any type of development or any other sort of activity that might disrupt the habitation? So it's not currently protected, but um, conversations have been had in terms of turning it into a marine park which would then give it some sort of protection, much more protection than it had now. Mm -hmm. All right. And we also understand that this, the, the, the landowner has been doing this development for a period of almost a year or up to a year. And, and we're now hearing conversations. Is it that the impact is only now um, taken act? The impact is now, you're only now seeing the results of the impact? Or is it because if he's doing this for over a year, how long has the conversation been going on? And who are the stakeholders involved in the conversation? So we have to operate by law. And the conversation has been going on for pretty much a year. They have, um, I've met with the landowner. I've met with the village council on numerous occasions because the calls have been numerous. It's, it's not something that a secret as to what the potential of what could happen. So we are trying to be proactive. The rainy season is approaching us and we are very well aware of what can happen. And that's the reason why we have been keeping the, the conversation going and trying to come to an amicable solution. And we're talking about um, stakeholder involvement and, you know, discussions and conversations like this. And I know that um, the, the agency EME was mentioned um, even in social media, by by regular citizens, are you in conversation with them as well? Of course, are they partnering on this matter to ensure, you know, some measures are put in place? Or, or what is the relationship like? And what is the conversation sounding like where they are concerned? So, I, well, uh, I, I mean, I'll, uh, answer, uh, I'll answer that. So, um, I've been in, you know, I've been holding discussions with the Environmental Management Authority, and uh, we all know that. Uh, the species, uh, the leatherback turtle, it is an environmentally sensitive species. Mm -hmm. And uh, under the Act, um, you could be fined up to $100,000 and, and about two years imprisonment, right? So, you know, just based on that, <laughs> and even the nature of the activity, um, I, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I'm the intricacies of the law, but um, this type of activity should require a CEC, a Certificate of Environmental Clearance. So we're basically calling on the EME to act, yeah? Um, the turtles, I mean, that the turtle season, it spans from March to about September. And, uh, you know, to have seen, you know, whoever it was that did the, the excavation at the, on the beach, um, you know, to just do that and have no thought about um, the impact on the species, that in itself is, you know, so disheartening. Yeah, so we are essentially calling on the EMER. It's been a year <laughs> and some, you know, for them to act. And you see, I wanted to, I, I specifically asked that question because I know sometimes when we see something mm -hmm. and we don't have all the information, you're left to Correct. coming up to your yes. own thoughts and you're, you're, you're left open to just, you know, speculation. Mm -hmm. yes. And so it is important to know that the conversation has been ongoing for yes. at least a year yes. between yourself, the landowner perhaps, the and the stakeholders, all the stakeholders, the village council, the village council mm -hmm. um, and all the persons who are impacted by this because as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't only affect the species of the turtle. Correct. What we don't realize is that human behavior impacts so many different, our very own Correct. lives. Correct. You know, and I know in the past in the news where we would see um, people being charged and fined for, for interfering with the same turtle, trying to ride a turtle, trying to on a live right. so, so, you know and so i want people to come to, to, to the realization that is not something to take lightly it has mm -hmm. happened and the discussion is ongoing there is an importance it is very 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 important that we protect the species listen we want to protect human lives the species human beings we want to protect ourselves it is also important for us to protect other species um whether it's wildlife whether it is um marine life i'm talking about marine life we're going to talk about that other topic um shortly as well and so you know i just want to join with you um to inform the public that 
it is not something that we just saw the video yesterday, but the conversation is ongoing. It's very important. And the primary objectives, I will leave that to you to tell us what the primary objectives are. Assemblyman, I know you said that eventually you want to turn it into a marine park so it would have some measure mm -hmm. of protection. And I want you to, 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 to just tell us a little bit more. What are you trying to get out of this at the end of the conversation? What are the primary objectives? Well, we, the, there are several things you can do. The area can be designated as an environmentally sensitive area or maybe even a heritage park. So there are many different options and models um, that we can look at. But what is important in this is that um, we need the public to report what they see and for the authorities uh, to basically give us the information that we need. And let me give you an example um, of what happened recently. So we have about six game wardens. As a matter of fact, we only have six game wardens at the division, and they have to respond to several complaints all over the island of Tobago. And um, they were responding to a matter on the port where someone had um, iguanas, yeah? So they did search search and they found the iguanas and the matter was taken to court and nothing came of it right a warning and then you know so they were caught up with dealing with the iguana issue and other reports around the island just six of them so by the time they got there on april 30th the um equipment was just parked at Corland, so they didn't know who did it and that is why we're asking the public i mean people know who did it right i don't know what is the fear of saying well this gentleman he was a driver but we need to know who right and um ema has a hotline and they're asking for information 367-8824 and you can whatsapp um to um ema 226-4-EME yeah so you use that hotline and please report what you see and they will keep the information confidential right mm -hmm. you see the thing is it's a corporate effort eh? mm -hmm. we all have to kind of band together to ensure mm -hmm. that we preserve uh what we have here in Tobago. and not only i know you mentioned that um mm -hmm. we want to know who the driver of the the yes. equipment is mm -hmm. i want to know who the owner is yes <laughs> right well, well we, <laughs> right so the the issue with the the um, equipment is that the equipment had bono markings on it mm. and as the secretary said by the time the game wardens got there no one was there okay so it, it it's up to the, the residents and the, the, and the resident. persons who, who were present to bring forward information so an investigation is ongoing it's to on have yes. conversations with these um with the, with the persons who are responsible for um doing this all right, so this is where we are right now. Conversations are ongoing. The issue is uh, a private developer is doing a development on his own property, which extended to a beachfront, the beach part of um, close by to his property, causing damage to, you know, the nesting area of leatherback turtles. And we saw some destruction of eggs as well, which means, of course, that these eggs will not hatch and we will not have those turtles on our shores. And so the conversation now is ongoing with the stakeholders, which include the Tobago House of Assembly representatives, the EME, other stakeholders, village councils. And the call is now upon the community at large if you see something, to report something, if you have any suspicion or any idea or any inclination, so please come forward. You can contact the AMA. As uh, Secretary said, the information is, re it remains confidential, so you don't have to be in any fear of anything like that. Let us come together. This is a situation we want to take seriously and we want to resolve it in the soonest possible time in the most amicable way. And eventually the hopes are, of course, to have the area protected when it is turned by the grace of God to a marine park where we can have protection there. Uh, remember this affects our tourism which means it affects our dollars and cents, it affects our livelihoods, it affects our culture as well, and it also would leave a sort of a, a conversation as to who we are as a people. So mm -hmm. let us come together to ensure that we can bring some measure of reserve. Uh, we're looking forward to hear the outcomes of this as the conversation continues and as um, you know decisions are made to protect this area and areas of this 
um, sort in the future. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're speaking with Assemblyman Natisha Charles Pantin and also Assemblyman Naya George as it relates to a, re a video recently circulated on social media involving the destruction of some leatherback turtle eggs as a result of development going on on a private property. And so we, you know, we th this is where we are with that topic right now. Mm -hmm. We're, we're going to go for a short break before we continue conversations in studio. We're asking that you stay with us. And while you stay with us, for a friend and share the life, share the life, share the life. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Good Morning Tobago and Tobago Updates Television. I am Adana Kambi and we continue conversation this morning in studio. We're speaking with Assemblyman Natisha Charles Pantin and also Assemblyman Niall George as it relates to a recent incident. And we also want to have um, some conversations as it relates to, we're talking now about <clears throat> an endangered, well, I don't know if it's, an, if it's classified as an endangered species. An, yet. An environmentally sensitive species. Environmentally sensitive species. And we have spoken about the issue that took place and the conversation that is um, happening right now. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk a little bit more about protection in terms of, I know we have a call, we have, we have an allowance for engaging in hunting, uh, which are um, wildlife hunting and, you know, partaking in, you know, the delicacies that can come from wildlife. And there's a period for that to take place as well. Um, and I know sometimes it happens outside of the period. What is that like in terms of how is it, how, what is it you, I know you are the manager for that particular thing. And how is it for you and your department, your officers in terms of managing um, human behavior again, as it relates to the hunting season in and out of season and having been in possession of wildlife outside of the hunting season? I have been involved in enforcing the law for 18 years as it relates to hunting, um, you know, cracking down on illegal hunting. And we had to look at it, at, you know, on two different um, sides. When the hunting season is closed, now the hunting season is actually from October 1st and ends at the end of February. And then you have one month um, that you, you have to discard of whatever you have in your fridge, whatever you have, you're frozen, right, or stored. You have one month to do that, yeah? And persons don't take it seriously, right? Some persons do not take it seriously. And we, we have officers, I myself have been, you know, trying to get out there, you know, responding to calls, doing search searches, and it's extremely difficult. Even sometimes you get threatened um, with weapons. So I'm familiar with it. I said, yes, yeah, we get threatened with weapons. As a matter of fact, we had officers, um, you know, trying to protect themselves from firearm, you know, exchange and, and, and fights. You know, because you, you, you need to see what is in the bag. You're just asking to see what is in the bag. And as, as a matter of fact, people even endanger their own lives because they try to evade us. They try to jump into the swamp and, you know, hide the bags. So you get some really creative <laughs> thinkers, you know, when they get caught. And, and it's even more disheartening when you face the court. And, you know, the other office, the officers, now that I'm the secretary, and, and this continues, the officers would be facing the court. And nothing comes of it. No fine. They just get a, you know, a little slap on the wrist, as you would want to describe it, and 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 release. And even the, what happened on the port when they searched and they found the iguanas, and you know, the officers expected that the magistrate would enforce the law, and and he didn't. And that was in the night, right? Just sac sacrificing your family time, your sleep time, to serve to begonians, to protect wildlife and the balance. Uh, on, on the island, the balance in nature, the uh, protect our ecosystem. And we understand, you know, everything, uh, how animals contribute to the entire, you know, um, thrust, you know, protection of the island, tourism, and to have the magistrate just slap and send them off. I'm tempted to ask <laughs> what might be the cause of this kind of action because you're talking here now about, as you mentioned, yeah. the balance. Yeah, but and the I'm balance wondering in nature. If 
if persons, if they have, if they have the education, they might have the information, but do they have the education in terms of the balance between wildlife and human life and all types of um, existences on the planet? Well, we have to, we have to assume so in some instances that people don't know. Um, I do not eat wild meat. So I don't know why it is so sweet to some people, <laughs> right? But um, I remember a case where there was a gentleman who decided to clear um, a section in the main ridge forest reserve mm. and plant dasheen. And when I investigated it, I was an officer at that time. He said to me that the government gave him land, but... The dasheen that grows in the main ridge, when you boil it, it's sweet. It does eat like bread. And I had to go through, you know, being threatened and all sorts of things, mm -hmm. right? And I, I said to him, the fine is very hefty, right? We'll have to enforce the law. And I'll also, you know, give you the information, set up you know, different um, educational opp opportunities for education. So he under, but he, to be honest, he, he didn't care about that. Eh? <laughs> he didn't care about that. So we had to go in and do some restoration work um, in that area that he cleared and planted his dashing. So that is some of the things that we face. Yeah. It's very unfortunate to hear this because, um, and I'm wondering if they, there needs to be some measure of aggressive public education, because here you are telling me that you've spoken to somebody on an individual basis, yes. explaining to them what the repercussions are, Yes, not just the fines or anything, that is yes. just surface, but yes. in terms of the longevity yes. of the spaces yes. and the places where we live and the generations that will come up that will not um, benefit from them. I'm wondering if there is anything or have you considered any aggressive public education to be to be done where that is concerned so that people can have an actual idea something that is visual that they can actually see what the destruction uh, would look like should mm -hmm. they continue in this type of behavior because i'm thinking oh, you know, this is a cultural and a behavioral change a, correct that we have correct. to um, approach yes and and the division we have all education was a big part of what i had to do and we would have done a lot of educational uh, material in schools at different levels, school toolkits. Um, you'd, you'll see many different material out there. You'd see my name on it as, when I was an officer. So we would have done that. And, and of course, we would have held community workshops. So we set up little workshops across the island to educate. We even speak to the hunters, right, themselves, and ask them to participate, you know, in, in vigilance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course you have, we appoint officers, you know, voluntary um, game wardens across the space as well. So we, we, do edu we do educate the public. But I like to, to tell people, because in my experience in 18 years, regardless of how much education you do, if you don't have enforcement, then it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's similar to what is happening with um, waste disposal now. Right. I, I would have built a, a really nice bin in my electoral district just as I entered office because people, they were just piling the, the rubbish at, at the side of the road. And there are two no dumping signs right next to the bin uh, because people dump outside of the bin. And even up to yesterday, when I passed by, people dump right by the no dumping sign. <laughs> so that is why we are appealing to people. To your, no, to your good nature, that we're trying to do something with Tobago, mm -hmm. right? We're trying to build on our image. Mm -hmm. So please, you know, try to do the best that you can do, right? And you mentioned something here. You're talking about having the information and the education is good, but the enforcement aspect of it is where the challenge is. Is there going to be or has there been any conversation with the um, persons who are responsible for the law? to ensure that they enforce the law. I think, I don't know if you've had that conversation yes. on what came of it and, you know, maybe to drive the importance because we're not seeing a change in behavior yes. based on the fact that the law, the enforcement of the law aspect is still a challenge. We always communicate and hold workshops with um, the TTPS, right? Um, but the challenge with that is they move them around. They don't always stay, you know, in their post or their position forever. And to combat that, we 
just do it every year. You know, we, we educate again and, you know, then they move again, you educate again. <laughs> so it, it's, a, it's a cycle. Yeah. But um, enforcement is key mm -hmm. um, because if somebody is fined $100,000 and, and, and it's not all and they spend two years in prison, mm -hmm. then I, I can guarantee you that the next person that interferes with the leatherback to the legs, mm -hmm. they will think again. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. That's right. You mm -hmm. know, sometimes you probably might just need to make an example of just one. Yes. Just one <laughs> to drive the point home. So, you know, yeah. we... we I want to I want to have continue having that conversation. I want to see how it goes and I would love to see um some measure of change taking place there because of course it's it impacts and it affects all of us. You know, um law upholding the law and enforcing the law is very important. And you mentioned, you know, even your own experience with seeing persons dumping right next to the no dumping sign behavioral changes again have to take place and you know we have a little tagline that says Tobago is the greatest little planet the greatest little island on the planet how are we going to do that we have to make better choices right I cannot be there all the time to see you put uh, uh, you know garbage into the bin and then if we have to put a camera by every bin in Tobago I mean, if we have to get to that, <laughs> oh, that I mean, that would be extremely depressing, yeah? Expensive so I have to get well. to that. Depressing and expensive. So can we make better choices as human beings? And, you know, the, even the way we treat each other, you know? So let's make better choices. We treat us, each other better. We treat animals better, right? Because we have to appeal to the good nature of people. Yeah, because people are inherently good. Right? But I, honestly, I don't know why wild meat is so sweet, because <laughs> I do not eat wild meat. <laughs> oh, yes. I've, I've tasted it once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, we really want to, I, I agree with you and yes. I, you know, I join with you. Yes. And let us um, kind of change the way, I mean, the thing sweet, as some people say, I've heard people say this, and yes. the thing sweet, and I understand. Sweet. But there's a period, there's a period where you can enjoy this, and it's from, it's, it's extensive, it's October to remind me again. October, yes, the 1st of October to the end of February, and then you have one month to cook out or this, you know, discard of what you have. So let's use that period. Position. Let's mm -hmm. use that period to enjoy mm -hmm. the, um, all the nice wild meat that mm -hmm. we have, you know, you're allowed to do it. So just do it within yes. that period and, you know, abide by the law. And let us not become slaves to the law and having to think, oh my God, looking over our shoulders. So let's just do the right thing the yes. first time. We are going to go for a short break before we continue conversations in studio as we're speaking with Assemblyman Natasha Charles Pantin and Assemblyman Niall George on topics that are relevant to Tobago at this time. So we want you to stay with us. And as you stay with us, we invite you to share the life, share the life, share the life. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Good Morning to Be Going to Be Going Updates Television. I am Adana Kambi and we continue conversations in studio. Yes, we still have Assemblyman Natisha Charles Pantin and Assemblyman Niall George. And we're having good, good conversation this morning. And I'm so happy that you're still with us to engage in these conversations with us. We want to talk about an incident that took place recently in Tobago. We're all aware, unless you're living on a rock somewhere, even internationally, people are talking about a recent incident taking place here in Tobago, where there was a shark attack in our shores where a visitor was, you know, affected by um, th this incident. And so now we've had to put measures in place to protect human life and to, find, to forge a way forward in terms of how are we going to continue with our regular activities as it relates to this incident. And so now here we are. Here we are. We've seen where the beaches have, um, we've had to close the beaches, of course, for obvious reasons. And so where are we now and what are the plans? Well, basically what we can talk about um, for now, where are we now in terms of managing um, and looking at reopening and, you know, all the other areas that have been impacted by this um on common behavior in our Tobago waters? Well, first of all, I, I just want to um, extend uh, my deepest, sincerest um, sympathy to the, the person who got, um, you know, bitten by the shark. And um, it's a tourist, a, a British national. And, uh, you know, I wish him all the best. Um, I also want to extend kudos to the Division of Health 
um, kudos to the secretary and her staff. They did a, an amazing job. The first responders, they did a, an amazing job. And these are the things that, you know, we have to boast about in Tobago, that we were able to respond to this situation in the way that we did. And it, I, it, it, they did a remarkable job at the Division of Health and the, the first responders. So we are at the point where we are preparing a marine hazard response plan. The only hazard is not um, the shark, yeah? And we have to look at how we manage that entire area. So we are having discussions, Tima, um, they are pulling together all the stakeholders, and we are having the necessary discussions. What we should implement, what should start, you know, what the protocols that um, should be, you know, engaged before the beach is opened. And the beach will be open in short order. So people need not to worry that this would be an extended period. But we have to be mindful that someone was attacked by a shark and our response as a country, as an island, we have to respond to it, right? So I, I, I'm, I'm hearing people say, no, it's just one shark. And no, 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 if, if I, or if you, right, were attacked by a shark, the natural response would be to close the beach, let's look at what happened, right? Investigate the matter, pull the stakeholders together and come up with a, a safety measure, right? Implement things that would make um, a, any other hazard, control any other hazard in the best way as a country, as and, an island. And you're mm -hmm. quite right because um, there are so many things mm -hmm. in terms of um, making the decision to reopen the beaches. Yes. There are so many questions that you have to ask Correct. in terms of, okay, what caused the shark to come ashore? Correct. Was there anything that was done um, by humans or was there Correct. any change in the current or is it a Correct. specific area that they are attracted to? So all these things I suppose would lead to your decisions in terms of when the beaches reopen and the protocols that will be put in place for the reopening of the beaches. As it stands now, what is the next step? What, where are we now and what is the first um, action that is going to be taken? I know we're having discussions. I spoke with Mr. Stewart just yesterday mm -hmm. and you know he was kind of walking me through where we are now. Um, you might not be able to say whether the beaches will reopen tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, but what is happening right now in the space in terms of making that decision? He spoke about training for lifeguards and stuff like Correct. that, but what is happening? Could Correct. you give me some more information? Correct, mm -hmm. yes. And that is why I said we're developing a marine hazard response mm -hmm. plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so training of the lifeguards, educate, educating the public on how to react should they see a, a predator, mm -hmm. right? Um, not only a shark, but a predator, right? And, um, you know, so a lot of, you know, things happening simultaneously. So you're seeing it being rolled out, um, right? And hopefully people are seeing it being rolled out. But, you know, you'll see the, you know, the educational part of it. And, you know, this morning I, I had a discussion with my husband um, as it relates to how people react generally to things that they have a phobia for, right? And... Um, no, he, he asked me what I have a phobia for, you know, and I asked him and then we went on to see, I went on to tell him, I know a, a young lady who are afraid of cats. She would see a cat and just get ecstatic and run. Right. But we have to understand that, you know, we, how we respond to wildlife. We are in their, um, habitat That's right. <laughs> and we have to manage how we respond in Tobago to um, different types of wildlife on the island, yeah? Mm -hmm. So I'll use the example. Trinidad has four species of poisonous snakes, right? Two types of mapipi, two types of coral. And Tobago, we have no poisonous snakes. But if we see a snake uh, in Trinidad, Trinidadians know how to respond because they, know, they are aware of what is poisonous, they know how to identify it, how to react, who to call, and in Tobago, when we see a snake, how do we respond? The first thing is to kill it. <laughs> now, snakes are protected, eh? Right? So we have to understand how to respond when we, we see any sort of wildlife. 
Mm -hmm. Right? That has to be managed. And I was, uh, the response part, I understand. And I was, I, I don't know if I was having an official conversation or unofficial, but I also was saying, yes, we have to know how to respond. We have to have the training and the education. But sometimes when you're in a real life situation, all Correct. the education goes out the Correct. window and you sort of panic. Correct. And that is what we also discussed. I said to him, it is not like they train us to respond you know, to calm down. Because if you see a shark and you start splashing up in the water, the shark will automatically think okay. you are prey and it will attack you, right? I don't know if I would just remain calm because I don't swim with sharks on a regular basis. So I don't know how they would respond. So that is why we need to ramp up on education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is important. The chances of a shark biting someone again or eating someone uh, again, it's it's very very rare. As a matter of fact, one in every four million people in the world. Mm -hmm. You know that's the, that is the chances. But if you look at it, how many accidents took place since the shark, mm -hmm. the um tourist? How many accidents? And yet still nobody is saying we're not going in a car again, <laughs> right? Yeah. So we have to put a response in place, a plan in place, mm -hmm. so that people make better decisions. Right. Even um, people were saying that the turtle legs, there's a correlation between what happened um, there and the, the shark attacking the gentleman. Mm -hmm. All sorts of hypotheses out there. Right. Hypothesis about um, maybe it could be fish guts being in the sea. We could think about all different things that global are as warming. global warming. Um, you know, the sharks may come closer to the coastline. So we, we have all, I mean, and, and they are plausible, um, you know, reasons. But we can't say for sure, but we should have a response plan in place should anything like that happen again. Oh, yeah. And to take the necessary precautions. Right? So that things like that don't, you know, we lessen the chances of it happening again. And, you know, I, I like the reference you made when you said um, in Trinidad there are four types of poisonous snakes. And so persons kind of know how to respond because it's part of the, you kind of, you, you, once you're born in Trinidad, you know they have poisonous snakes. So you kind of know you might have heard mm -hmm. it in school. Yeah, no. There would have been some measure of education as well. And so the education has to continue as it relates. This is something that is very rare, very uncommon. It's not as if we have sharks living in our waters that will attack somebody again tomorrow. But you never can tell what would happen. Correct. Because the investigations, as I assume, are still ongoing in terms of Correct. what caused this action. And so Correct. the education has to continue. It has to be aggressive. And persons, of course, have to pay attention. Mr. Stewart was here yesterday, yeah. and one of the things he was saying is that people need to ensure they take the instructions from the relevant authorities, Correct. the relevant agencies. Correct. Uh, the predator might have been there for a while, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they might come around for a while. We don't know. So you still have to take the necessary precautions, right? How do you react when you see a predator, right? What should you do? And sharks, people think that you will always see a shark fin coming towards you. No, no, no. Even in three feet of water, a shark could be submerged there. Mm. So you still have to um, listen out, look out for what we are going to put out there to protect you as a Tobagonian and, and also by extension the entire world. You know, I'm looking out, I'm sitting here and in my brain it's churning and I'm, I'm looking out for some enactments of what can actually happen, you know. I, I'm looking out to see, can we have something where we gather, whether it's in a, in a pool, for instance, and we have some kind of, you know, real life type of situation see, to see how people respond. You see, we looked at enough Jaws movies <laughs> in our entire <laughs> lifetime to think that what happened in that movie going to happen now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we really need to educate the public. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a good place to end this morning. You know, we're talking about so many things this morning. And right now, what is happening is that the education is continuing as it relates to, you know, in preparation for reopening our beaches, yes. in preparation <clears throat> for people to be able to enjoy and engage in an early morning bath. You know, the older people like yes. to go and sap the knee in the morning yes. and stuff like that so those things are being considered however the education has to be put out there yes. and uh, this is a reminder for you to ensure you get the information from the authorized and relevant authorities do not make your own assumptions or your own assessments 
because they might not be accurate. And so you want to pay attention to what is being said by the persons who are in authority and responsible for ensuring the safety of human life the safety of wildlife, and of course, a space where we can, all can enjoy and live quite comfortably. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for staying with us this morning as we spoke about pertinent topics, relevant topics. We had a beautiful Assemblyman, Natisha Charles Pantin, and Assemblyman Niall George here this morning talking about issues relating to Tobago. We will, we will definitely get more information. We'll bring more information to you and keep you posted as um, solutions come to these uh, situations. Thank you so much. This is where we end. Thank you for joining us. I am Adana Kambi.